this session. Now, this session, as well as being a session of this programme, is also part of uh, a months-long uh, initiative of The Economist called Open Futures. Um, it, we're envisaging this as a conversation on the role of markets, technology and freedom in the 21st century, and it has various strands, and two of the strands are open societies and open progress. So open societies looks at things like civil liberties and diversity, so LGBT equality is part of that. And open progress is about technology and information, so quite obviously our next session fits into both of those. So I think we have a short video that we're going to play on open future, is that correct? So I'm going to get out of the way, and if not, I'll return. For 175 years, The Economist has been doing more than reporting news. It's been championing values, promoting open societies, challenging special interests, making the case for decisions based on cold, hard facts. We set the agenda for free trade and globalization. We made the case for same-sex marriage and private space exploration. But in an age of populism, these values are in jeopardy. So we've begun Open Future, a global conversation with critics and supporters on the vital issues of today. From free trade and free speech to immigration, diversity and technology. It's a conversation we began in 1843 when we argued against tariffs on grain and continued with other causes like prison reform and ending slavery. We've led the debate on drug legalization and on regulating the titans of tech. Now it's time to shape the agenda for the challenges of the 21st century. A discussion will lead through articles, events and online debates in contests, films and podcasts. It's time to renew the mission for an open future. So I'd really sincerely like to invite you all to join this conversation over the coming months. Uh, we have online material, we have uh, most days something new will go up. Um, there is a, a live debate that's running on this, on, on, on this topic this week, and um, the finale will be a festival on Saturday, September 15th, which is chaired by Zanny Minton Beddoes, our editor, and several of my colleagues. Um, so tickets will be on sale shortly to that, and uh, it'll be open to the public. Anyway, now for our session, I have two Matts. So I'm going to invite Matt Beard and Matt Britton. Matt Beard is of All Out, a campaigning group against discriminatory laws and enforcement, and uh, Matt Britton of Google, who's, he's the president of EMEA at Google. So please do join me. Right, this one's Matt Beard and that one's Matt Britton. So or maybe I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm just going to ask all questions of Matt and see who answers. Whoever's fastest off We're the draw. We're striking a blow for diversity here. <laughs> Matt B's on yeah, OK. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Let's think, rethink that at the next conference. And so when social media started, I think we were all extremely optimistic that this was going to be, I mean, possibly naive and optimistic because we were forgetting that human beings aren't always perfect. But we thought that this was going to be, that people would use these connections in ways that you know, would open things up, enlighten people, that it would all be about information, that it would bring democracy to the world and so on. And I mean, those things still happen. But I think our attitudes towards social media have really gone the other direction, probably too far, I think both of you would feel, more towards thinking that it's about filter bubbles, that it's about um, you know, fake news, that it's about uh, things being hijacked to be anti-democratic, you know, outsiders coming in and arguing, say, about the repeal of the Eighth in Ireland, you know, and so on. So I don't want to be on either side of that, but um, it seems to me that the devil has got all the best tunes at the moment. Like, at the moment, the narrative is, you know, social media is bad, that it's about clicktivism, that it's about um, bubbles. Can I ask each of you to sort of challenge that? Tell me why you think I'm wrong there. Let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I can start, and I, and I do think that you're absolutely spot on when you say that this is a platform, it is cause agnostic, and those who we may not agree with, those who most people in this room may not agree with, can also use it, and they sure. do use it very effectively. Um, an organization called Citizen Go, which campaigns against uh, reproductive rights and LGBT rights right across Europe, claims to have 9.4 million members and is being very effective in that digital space. However, because it is cause agnostic, it also means that the angels can also win this. 
you know, when one person stands up for LGBT rights, that doesn't necessarily have an impact. But when hundreds of thousands or even millions of people come together in common cause, that makes a hell of a lot of noise. It can change conversations. It can really change hearts and minds. And I think that is what happens around LGBT rights when groups like All Out raise voices together in, in common cause. Just to give you just two very quick examples uh, from my own organization. When the horrors started last year in Chechnya, as gay and bisexual men were hunted down, rounded up, taken to illegal detention centers, tortured, and in some cases, killed, we were able to mobilize incredibly quickly. To working together with other organizations and our partners in Russia, we kept this in the media. We, we made sure that the voices of our partners in Russia and Chechnya were being heard. Two million people raised their voices in a petition, and we were able to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to support our partners evacuating individuals from Chechnya who'd, even, who'd either been in the camps or who were at risk of going in there. Just one other quick example. Um, in 2016, um, an American pastor called Stephen Anderson was planning a speaking tour in South Africa. Uh, some of you may recognize that name. He was the man who celebrated the deaths of 49 LGBT people at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, in front of his con congregation. And we raised the voices of tens of thousands of people around the world. We presented the South African government with a dossier of evidence against him. And those two things together led to that the, the South African government denying him an entry visa and denying him the opportunity to spread that hatred. So while it can be misused, while it can be used by our opponents, we need on the angel side to become better, to become smarter at using it effectively. Other match. Hello. <laughs> um, so firstly, I think we should be careful about the language we're using here. So I think what we should be talking about is technology and you know, the role it can play in both supporting and sometimes being negative about some of these, I these issues. I think social media is one aspect of that. But you know, t today we're in a world where nearly three billion people have got the entire internet in their pockets. And when you look at what they're doing with it, overwhelmingly it's incredibly positive. And if you think about Google search, people are searching trillions of times a day for things that are helpful for them, educational, you know, health issue, or finding something at the right price or whatever. Um, and also everybody who's got a smartphone has also got a camera and an ability to publish, which is where the social media sort of aspect comes in. And again, that's overwhelmingly a positive thing. We're in a bubble at the moment, or a period, where some of the stuff that uh, is happening is because everyone's online. And that means, you know, just the same as in the real world, some people are bad actors and have got a different agenda from the rest of us. And I think trying to understand what we should do about those things is really important. So it's good that, that those stories have prominence, but I think they're disproportionately prominent versus the overwhelming uh, thing that's going on. And, and particularly in this area, um, it's people being <coughs> able to find that they're, you know, that they're not alone. Mm. Um, you know, at a very simple level, it might be I'm not alone because I've got a hobby and you know, this is something obscure, but obviously in many cases it's people discovering their sexuality, discovering their identity and connecting other people with like them. I was really struck, I had a conversation several years ago now with Tom Daly, the diver, who uh, was using YouTube to um, post uh, video blogs uh, regularly, and you know, famously he posted uh, a video that he made uh, coming out to uh, people. And um, he was overwhelmed by the positive reaction. I think that video has been watched in excess of 22 million times now and a uh, hugely positive reaction from people saying, you've made it possible for me to think about this. And that's one tiny example, but there are many, many more of those. So I think if you, if you look at the facts, there is a hugely positive agenda here. And of course, there are you know, bad things that are happening as a result of everyone uh, being there. And it's up to organizations like ours and debates like this to help us think through how do we deal with those challenges where we haven't necessarily got all the rules of the world in the digital, rules of the world, rules, rules of the road in the digital world that we have in the physical world. So Matt Beard, you, um, you mentioned that there were campaigning things that you could do with the power of social media. And the things you mentioned were about um, you know, 
uh, asking a government to deny somebody a visa or also producing money. And neither of these are the sort of clicktivist, easy sort of I like something or I retweet something or something like that. Um, do you think that those sort of easier things, I don't know, putting a rainbow banner on your Facebook page or your, you know, liking or retweeting, do you think these things also have a positive effect or do you think they're just ways that people feel they've done something and then they can move on? No, I do, I do think they can have a positive effect. I don't think they're sufficient. Right. I think the other kind of harder work is incredibly important. We, we need to engage in political advocacy. We need to raise money for frontline and grassroots groups. But something like a Twitter or a Facebook filter does have impact, in my opinion, because what it does is show that there are millions of us, that there are millions of us standing together, millions of us speaking with the same voice. I think it goes to your point about sort of reducing that sense of isolation. Um, you know, we, uh, to give an example of how we, we've used that tactic, you know, uh, some of you will know for the last two years, um, our friends in Uganda have had Pride raided by the police in 2016 brutally. Um, we've done various harder things to support them, but, but right after 2016 Pride, we also uh, introduced a, a Facebook filter which you, where you could just say, I stand with Pride Uganda, and we accompanied that with solidarity messages. And our partners in Uganda were really so moved by that. They were moved by tens of thousands of people changing their Facebook pictures and sending messages of solidarity. They talked about what an amazing kind of power boost that was to them. So while that seems something very small and insignificant, and while many people would write it off as a piece of armchair activism or clicktivism, combined many, many hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of times, that can have impact. So one of the tricks that um, PR people use that every journalist knows is that when you call them to ask them something, they say, oh, that's old news, or everyone knows that, or um, you know, I don't even know why you'd bother with that. That's not actually a story. So I wonder if part of what you're doing with these uh, filters and so on is that you're making a story. Already, if tens of thousands of people are doing something, it's now a story, and people can't say, there's no story here. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree. And by the way, if anyone here is in PR, please stop doing it. It's extremely irritating. But, but because what, what we need to do to get that visibility, to, to, to get these issues onto the agenda, onto the harder bits of the agenda where we're driving policy change, where we're driving attitudinal change, is to grab attention. That's one of the hardest things to yeah. do in this digital space. And by grabbing attention, we then move something up to the next level yeah. where real change can happen. And I think this would be a moment for me to kind of offer a critique of that poll question because it, oh, yeah. it presented a kind of binary choice between digital activism and grassroots activism. And I think where activism and advocacy is at its very strongest is when you bring those things together, when you drive synergy from those two things together. And so I, when I looked at those polls, I wasn't able to answer that either way because it's it's very much both. In my well, opinion. yeah, but I'll tell you another journalist's trick now, which is that sometimes you have to get people to get the, get yes. the damn fence, you know? Especially when you're talking to academics, they always tell you that it's both. Whatever it is you're asking them, they say it's both. And you say, no, if you have to choose one, which one? <laughs> so, all right. Um, so, you know, I can't have somebody from Google here and not say that you, you know, you really are one of the, because you're one of the big companies, you get you know, a lot of the flack, always. Um, obviously. Sometimes. You, yeah, no, I mean, I'm sure you do. If, if, if anyone isn't giving you a flag, then they're not doing their job. I've, I've read The Economist. Yeah. yeah, of course you have. Yeah. <laughs> and you still came. What a sport you are. Well, because look, I do think, um, you know, it's important to debate these things. And it's important, you know, when you say things like, you know, well, social media this and sort of inclus include the entire internet, I want to be able to pick up and say, well, it's not that. Let's actually look at what's going on. And a lot of the things that we're sort of facing in the world of technology today, easily summarised in a headline, but actually you need to get a level below the headline to sort of understand... Uh, what's going on and I think you know traditional media is being massively disrupted by the fact that everyone is a publisher and everybody can read all sorts of stuff not just the, the great material that The Economist to which I'm a subscriber and have, and have been a fan for my life really you know is, is obviously credible quality news but there's also all sorts of other stuff out there and just because the other stuff isn't published by The Economist doesn't mean to say it's rubbish some stuff is and I think that's one of the challenges. You know, you, you mentioned fake news, and we should, we should talk about this a bit, and then I want to come back to, to the core subject. You know, um, in, this sort of, in the face of the populism that your video brilliantly pointed out, uh, 10 billion times a month people come to Google and ask us about the news. 10 billion times a month. And we send them to uh, 
one of 80,000 credited news publishers who are who they say they are, they're not fake news. So 10 billion times a month, clicks come from us to you and, you know, your fellow publishers that are from people who are really interested in the news. And that's, you know, people are more interested than ever before in the news. Paying for it much less, though. Well, that's, you know, this shouldn't be about the news. But, you know, secondly, uh, we help news organisations online make money to the tune of $12 billion last year through digital advertising. We're in a week of GDPR as well as LGBT. I thought I would come to the wrong acronym <laughs> uh, for a moment. Uh, and, you know, so people are thinking about protecting their personal data and identity online. And that means that some of that's going to be more challenging. But one of the things we most care about is how people can access quality content online. Um, I wanted to make a broader point, which is that, you know, one of the things technology is doing is it's changing time and space. So, you know, if you are in Africa and you have a smartphone, you can find what's going on in the world. Um, you can watch Tom Daly video. You can understand that people are supportive of your agenda in their tens of thousands. This is transformational. So it's sort of collapsing space in many ways. Uh, but it's also changing time. So what's hot in the news might not be, to me, you know, today, might not be a story today at all. It might be, you know, I was privileged to attend Pride in London this year, which is absolutely phenomenal celebration. And I was talking to my 16-year-old uh, kid uh, about it. He didn't know anything about it. And he looked it up online, and he started to look at how long ago was Clause 28 brought in. And he couldn't believe the story behind it. And he was digging into that. And for him, that was news. And so I think that time and space are both, are both different in today's world, and they're not the way that the weekly published economist thinks about it anymore for everybody at every moment. So I said at the beginning that I think that the devil has all the best tunes at the moment, and I hope that doesn't last. One of the things that I think may happen is that we all get better at, you know, we get better at living in this very fast-changing world. Like maybe, maybe the next election we'll be, we'll be better at looking at our sources. Maybe the next election we'll, uh, you know, just, just be less blindsided or wrong-footed by the way things have changed? Or do you think that the technology will have speeded up again so much that the next election cycle, again, you know, there's a whole new set of problems and difficulties and new players and new styles of communicating and going over the head of the traditional gatekeepers? I mean, what's your feeling? Do we settle down in a new normal or do we just keep... Well, I think, you know, what, there's, there's been a problem that is that we collectively have not been listening to people. We and collectively meaning who? I think, you know, the, the metropolitan bubble, okay. journalists uh, and, uh, and politicians. Um, now, you're, you're looking puzzled at that, but I think about, you, th you think about the Brexit vote, you think about the Trump campaign. You know, we haven't been paying attention to what ordinary people are concerned about in the way that we need to if we're going to reflect the world that we're living in. One of the ways you can pay attention, actually, is by looking at what people are doing on social media and by listening to things like, you know, what's the trends in what people are searching for and so on. These are tools that are available. So I think we all need to pay attention more to what everyday, everyday people are confronting in their lives. And I think there are ways that you can use technology to help you do that better. Matt Beard, do you think uh, we're going to he head into a new normal where people are using these tools as digital natives? Or do you think that things are going to keep changing and, you know, we keep feeling like we're, you know, it's racing away from us the... Well, I'd, I'd probably again say both. I mean, I, no, I, no, I, no, I think, off I, the fence, I think, mate. I, I think to, to answer that question it probably depends on where you are in the world. Right. Um, so, you know, I'd like to just like focus in on a minute on kind of LGBT activism in Africa, um, with an absolute explosion of digital connect connectivity on a small screen across that continent. There'll be more internet-enabled mobile phones in Africa than there are in Europe as early as 2025, and it's our contention at All Out that the, the battle for hearts and minds, the battle for winning this narrative around LGBT equality will take place on those small screens. It will still take place in courtrooms. It will still yeah. take place on the streets. It will still take place in the corridors of power through high-level advocacy, but it will also take place um, by African activists across the continent being able to master existing and future mobile technologies, being able to tell stories effectively with that technology, and, and yeah, being able to win that narrative. I mean, a dystopian version of that is that everyone who has a small screen in their pocket also has, you know, an ability to be tracked, an ability to be overseen by governments, you know. How do we, how do we stop that sort of dystopian version and we keep the direct connectivity and the lack of, of gatekeepers keeping out voices, for example, of, you know, yeah. activists? By investing. By investing in the ability of LGBT activists across that continent to claim their rights in the digital age and stay safe. 
So we've been training activists in Uganda, Nigeria, and Kenya on how to use that technology effectively, but also how to stay safe while using it. Yeah. And it's about outsmarting the opposition. It's about outsmarting those who would use those tracking devices, those who want to push an, an alternative narrative. And, you know, this is the moment where I, do, where I kind of ha have a moment to kind of say that that does require investment. And, mm. well, you know, investment in what? In, By whom? In, in investment in capacity, in investment in grassroots movements across, uh, for the sake of this argument, across Africa. You know, many of the conversations this morning were uh, unable to answer the question what large multinational corporations should do when they are operating in jurisdictions that are hostile. Mm -hmm. One thing that can be done is by investing in these movements so that the societies in which these corporations are actually functioning are becoming increasingly LGBT positive, increasingly able to um, deliver positive change for LGBT people and therefore more likely to change the laws that will enable those corporations to, to do what they need to do in those countries in the first and place. So that, that's what you all should do if you don't know what to do in a hostile environment. Fund grassroots LGBT groups. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just wanted to, I mean, it, it, to connect with what you're saying there and, and connect also with the, the early discussion on journalism. And I think, you know, it's really important to have an independent press and to have quality mm -hmm. content being published in those contexts as well to hold people accountable. And I think, you know, some of the things we try to do are build tools to stop, uh, you know, online attacks that take down uh, news sites. So Project Shield is a free way in which, you know, our infrastructure can stand behind you if you're a publisher to stop that kind of internet-based attack on uh, free speech, journalism, accountability, and so on. I think, you know, th those are the kinds of things which we can do to invest and support uh, positive change in those places. And actually, you know, it's extremely empowering if people can ac access the world's information and can see those things in parallel. I, I think it it's a bit of a false choice. I I I'm finding myself agreeing with you and your, your kind of opening statement about false questions, you know. Uh, there isn't a digital activism and physical activism. There's just activism. You know, the digital world and the physical world for most of us here, and increasingly for people in Africa, are the same place. And so what we should be doing is, is using all the tools at our disposal, whether they happen to be digital, app, smartphone, or they happen to be organizing physically with people, you know, to campaign and, and, and make change happen. And I think thinking about those two spaces as separate is, is um, a bit out of date. I think the, um, all the same questions do come up in the, you know, the real world and the physical world. The real world is basically now the digital world, I think, for a lot of people. Um, but they are often more pointed in the digital world just because, you know, speed, yeah. scale, um, the lack of any barriers and immediacy and so on. But so two, I see two sort of utopian, dystopian questions on this that I would like um, in Matt Britton to respond to. So one of them is a battle between free speech and stopping hate speech. Yeah. And then the other one is the, um, the panopticon that, you know, if you have your phone in your pockets, you can be constantly surveilled, but also you can constantly get the word out. I mean, we heard earlier about people who were being arrested who were able to get the word out straight away. How do we think very clearly, all of us, but I think Google and, you know, is really at the cutting edge or the front line of this a lot of the time, how do we find a way between these two utopian, dystopian, you know, futures on those yeah. two issues? Uh, so I think those are great questions and one of the reasons I said I think it's really important for these debates to be in public and then not to just be at the headline level because it's easy to sort of say, you know, fake news dominates the internet, etc. Um, you know, an example, so let's take fake news and then go into sort of hate speech. So uh, what's new in the digital world about fake news? There's always been fake news around in the sense of kind of misreporting and so on or publishers with a particular agenda skewing all of their content in a particular line. But what's new is the ability to misrepresent at scale and speed. Um, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, th this is something that the social media companies have really struggled, struggled with. As I say, at Google, when you come to us, you tell us, I'm interested in this news story, and we can go to a publisher that we've worked with for 16 years to, to point you to the news. However, why is it that people are motivated to produce fake news? Well, actually, there are an economic incentive. So why is it that one village in Macedonia pumps up 150 websites about the US election. It's because, well, they might be able to make some money from it. So some of the things we can do are try to make sure there aren't economic incentives for those people to do that. So strengthening our policies against misrepresentation. You know, as I said, we pay out billions to publishers, helping them advertise, make money from advertising online. We don't want fake news to be a part of that. So there are things which we can do uh, there. 
I think uh, freedom of speech and hate speech is obviously a much more sort of nuanced and challenging area. Mm. So, um, you know, the joy of Tim Berners-Lee's invention of the World Wide Web is that everybody can publish anything over there. The problem is that everybody can, can do that. So, so how do you deal with that? And I think it's something which we particularly confront on YouTube, which we own and operate as a hosted pl platform. It's wonderful. Anybody can share a video. You can learn from it. Um, but, you know, where do you draw the line? And there are some things where the law draws the line for you. Uh, and it, it's fine. So people will say to me, Matt, you know, you, you seem to be able to, uh, another thing would be pornography. Quite good at keep, keeping pornography off YouTube. Well, firstly, if you asked everybody in the room to identify from a series of shots what was and wasn't pornography, you'd have pretty much 100% agreement. And then secondly, you can imagine how there are commonalities to do with uh, pornography that machines could identify pretty quickly. Splash tones, soundtracks, whatever, I don't know, but, you know, you can You've imagine. never seen any either, um, yeah. But... Why can't we do that with hate speech so easily? And that's been in the news in the last year, and rightly so. Uh, well, firstly, if we all looked at 100 hate speech videos, we might I'm not talking, all agree I'm talking, I'm as to which ones were or weren't um, tolerable. And, you know, it's typically a man talking to a camera about politics. To a Quite hard to do. Secondly, context matters. So if that is part of a clip that Al Jazeera have put up with editorial surround, that you know, is legitimate editorial content. If it's post posted by a terrorist group, then it's not. So we've had to work really hard with a lot of experts to try to identify more clearly what our policies should be to draw those lines and then invest in people and in machines to be able to uh, make that policy live online. So I think that's just an example of some of those things which we and others are having to confront, and we can't do it alone. We have to do it with government, we have to do it with experts, uh, such as MAPS kind of organisation, we have to do it with, um, uh, with law enforcement and other officers around. And I think that's part of you know, the tech industry, if you want, maturing, but also it's part of a debate with society deciding where, where do we want to draw those lines as a as society. So I'm going to open up for questions. So uh, just to remind everyone, this is Matt Beard, that's Matt Britton, or you can say Google guy, other guy, whatever you like, and, or they can both answer any question you, you want. So hands up if anyone wants to ask a question. Yeah, I have a question here. Hi, um, uh, Matthew Beard, you spoke about clicktivism and how in Uganda Pride, tens of thousands of people could receive positive encouragement from other parts of the world. How do you deal with when that works in the opposite direction? So, for example, I work for the I newspaper and also for Pink News. Now, we've done lots of stuff on trans things where anti-trans people have then en masse, thousands of them, abused the individual journalist who's reported it and anybody involved in the story to the extent that that journalist or reporter that's done an honest story feels unable to continue reporting it or threatened. And they've done, in a way, the exact same thing that you referred to in a positive way, but in a negative how do we tackle that, and where is the line with freedom of speech on that? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think it goes back to the previous question about that um, very murky line between freedom of speech and, and, and hate speech. My personal view is that the kind of example you're talking about can't necessarily be stopped in a free and democratic society, but what we do need to do, as I mentioned earlier, is be smarter than them about chasing the energy, about capturing popular spirit, about bringing together more voices than they do in solidarity, in uh, a spirit of, of standing up for trans people. I, I think to try and close them down will actually just create even more backlash for trans folk. I think what we need to do is, is get better at mobilizing even more people, an army of equality um, that, that can out, outmatch them and outsmart them. Yeah, I think one of the challenges you sometimes find is that activists who have only, the only route they've got is to try to use social media or technology to reach people tend to be better than some of the civil society organisations that want to counter. And so that's, we've certainly seen that in, the, in, you know, in some areas of violent extremism. And actually, one of the things we've been trying to do is work with civil society organisations to get better at having counter narratives. That's not directly to your point, but I think that is one of the things. You know, the people who've become expert in this are the people for whom it's the only option. And there's a bunch of us who are operating you know, behind the curve on that front. And, uh, and I think that's something that we really need to sort of work on. So there's a program of educating and helping people produce content and um, evidence that counters. Can I, can I just sure. add to the, my answer on that as well? You know, I think it's also to do with this concept of, of new power. Uh, Jeremy Hymans is one of the founders of All Out. He's recently written a book on new power, which is really talking about and making the argument that those that can capture 
open, participatory, open source forms of mass action and collective action, they are people who are going to win the battles for all sorts of different types of power. And I think, as Matt has just said, some of our opponents have been very, very good at using new power. Um, one, of, you know, one of the best um, operators of new power right now is actually ISIS, um, that is really able to use a participatory methodology that speaks to people on their own terms and is, and, and is engaging people in a, in a deeply disturbing and destructive way. And I think one of the challenges that, that we face working in the digital environment, working for LGBT plus rights, is, as I actually keep saying, to we need to be better than they are at doing this stuff. I mean, we, we need to leverage new power to, 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 to make the angels win. So I have a sort of a personal answer to that, which is that um, I, I'm often quite grateful at The Economist that we're anonymous, uh, because as a woman who is in journalism and is online and you know, sometimes has opinions that are, well, opinions, uh, if I wasn't anonymous, I think I'd get more rubbish. So if your journalists aren't anonymous, well, they don't have that easy way out. Um, obviously, there's a duty of care to them. If somebody feels they can't keep going, uh, you're going to have to try to find other ways to do your journalism. You know, maybe allow that person's name not to appear first. Um, some women have found uh, male colleagues helpful on this. Uh, you don't want to give someone else, use someone else's byline, I don't mean that, but you know, do some stories that you've got two stories together from different people. Um, get the editor to take some of the heat. Um, maybe help them to filter their emails, uh, maybe get someone else to answer the phone for them and so on. So, so, so there's sometimes there are kind of, you know, kind of old-fashioned barriers that you can put up in the way of the worst bit. But then behind all of that, I think we just have to actually win the argument. Whatever the argument is, if you don't win it, you haven't won it. So, you know, it's not about there's 10,000 on this side and 100,000 on this side. In the end, that's not what it's going to be. Do I have another question? Because I've got a minute. Yeah, go on. Yeah, thank you. For, uh, for Matt Britton, um, you mentioned you know, Google working with governments, but I'm, I'm just curious because as the Cambridge Analytica scandal showed us, it, it seems that the ability of um, social media networks and you know, user-generated content sites to police themselves has not been very good. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, sometimes you, just, you do need to roll out the stick right, in order to keep, um, keep things clean, basically, online um, to, the, to the point where they should be. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what, is, what is the proper role of government in this sort of watchdog role? Um, you know, if you being from Google, there's obviously a, a case to be made for, you know, greater freedom from, from your end, but I'm just curious, you know, what's, what's your opinion about that? Uh, so, so it's a very broad question. Um, I think I can't speak for Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. I, I know as much as anybody here who's read about that, that stuff. But I, I mean, I do think uh, technology issues are fast moving and um, to engage with them from a regulatory standpoint requires some... Uh, you know, time to sit down and understand them. And so I think it's incumbent upon both politicians, policymakers, and technology companies to sort of spend the time to understand what's possible. And I've seen a bunch of examples where we've been able to do that, where we've made real progress together. So you support uh, and develop legal frameworks, but you also use technology to help address the problem. A simple example would be on something like YouTube, where copyright violation, violation and piracy is a problem. We build a bunch of tools that actually allow copyright owners to find and manage their own content that work brilliantly, and 90% of copyright owners now leave their content up, but they can manage it. Child sexual abuse imagery with governments, counter-terrorism with governments. These, these things are things where we actually... The EU has had a global internet forum for the last three years where we and the other big technology companies sit down with the home security ministers of every EU government and we look at what we can do to fight terrorism. Some of it is counter speech, uh, some of it is actually fingerprinting and sharing uh, technology between us. So I do think there are roles there. Another thing I think is important is transparency. So for, for many years we've published a transparency report that tells you, and you can just go online and search for transparency report, tells you what requests we get from governments around the world to take down content off various platforms and the percentage of those which we honour and don't honour and why. Um, and I think that kind of thing is also helpful because it's also the case that not every government plays by the rules that they set themselves. Um, so I think this is something where it's important to engage. We should, there's a risk we talk past, e past each other. You know, th they yell for the headlines and, and we sort of, like engineers, say we can just fix it through engineering. Neither is right. It needs collaboration. <laughs> Thank you very much to both my speakers. It was a really great place to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So before I hand over to Sasha, I think I've got the answer to our poll coming up. And this time I'm going to try and read it properly. Yeah, here we go. So we asked the question, do you think LGBT, LGBT advocates should focus more on broad activism through online petitions and retweets, sometimes known as clicktivism, or on smaller scale local activism, taking into account that everyone wanted to say both? Here we had local activism at 83% and broad online support at 17%. This, I think, is the only one where we've switched direction, but then the uh, other one was online, so I don't think that you can ask a Twitter poll about should you be on Twitter or not, you know. So, all right, great. So over to Sasha for her next session.